And that's how we know that Albert Wesker hasn't brushed his teeth since at least 9-11. Oh, shit. Wait, i got to get this. Hello? Oh, hello there, young man. Is your mother home? Yes, but she can't come to the phone right now. Can I take a message? Sure, let me just... Wait... I know that voice, are you Pixelbush? Oh, yes, that, that's me. Awesome, I've watched all your videos. My favorite one was about Jonah. God, he's such a cool character. Easily the best character in DVD. Really? I thought you'd more of a uh, Michael Myers kind of guy. Nah, I've always preferred the Rob Zombie version. Well, each their own, I guess. Now, what about you? You've got to know a lot about horror movies to make those videos, so go on, tell me. What's your favorite scary movie? Well, I guess that depends on definition. Like, you could, you could call Malignant a scary movie, but whether it's even a horror is up for debate. Like, it was surely marketed as a horror, but in reality it was more of a Neo Giallo or even a dark superhero origin story. But, you know, that doesn't necessarily preclude it from being a... Shut up, I don't really care what your favorite movie is. Wow, rude. Who do you think you are, anyway? I'm the guy who's gonna gut you like a fish if you don't shut up and listen. Oh well, joke's on you. I'm a dead by daylight YouTuber. I don't contribute anything to society. My life has no value. Do you want to stop making threats, mate? You might want to do a little bit better than that. Check Discord. Please, don't hurt them, I'll do anything. I won't harm a woolen hair on Charlotte's head if you answer these three simple horror trivia questions. You're Mr. Loreman, you should be good at this. Right, okay, I can do that. Question one, during the filming of Saw 3, how did they make the pig carcasses for Judge Halden's trap? Oh, that one's easy. They used foam and rubber to make the corpses themselves, but they used real-life maggots stuck to the models with honey for close-ups. To this day, if you lick one of the props from that shoot, it'll taste like honey. Wait, how the fuck did you know that? Don't ask. Right, uh, okay. Question two, what is Leatherface's real name? Well, I think the answer here is... It depends. After the original film, none of the family even had names. They were just the cook, the hitchhiker, and Leatherface. But in the sequels, they did start to get names. In 1987, for example, the original sequel, he was known as Bubba Sawyer, but that's a fact that was never remains consistent in any of the sequels, reboots, or requels that came afterward. That's not even beginning to mention the 2003 reboot, where the Sawyers had the name changed to the Hewitts, and Leatherface was given a new name, Jedediah, made him drop with the family in the prequel to that at the beginning of 2006. Like, admittedly, that hasn't remained canon with the recent 2022 um, requel, I want to say, but it certainly has impacted the... Um... Will you shut up? <sighs> so did I get it right, then? Yeah, I'd say you covered it. Just about. Now question three, the most important question. Are you ready? What's that knock at the door? Holy shit, it's Neve Campbell! Well, as I was saying before I was so rudely interrupted, welcome, friends and foes, survivors and killers. 
Let's sit around the campfire together and talk about Dead by Daylight. Specifically, Beneath the Mask. The new story in Tome 13 Malevolence, starring Danny Johnson or The Ghostface. Let me start out by saying I didn't really know what to expect from this story. Behaviour has a very on and off relationship with handling the law of the licensed content well. Tap Story is one of the most narratively and emotionally intelligent tome stories ever, but Bill and Amanda's stories may as well have been scrawled on the wall of a public bathroom in Egyptian hieroglyphics written with shit and earwax for all the useful insights they actually provided. So when it came time to giving a tome to Dead by Daylight's first and to date only hybrid licensed character, there's so much that could have gone right or wrong with fleshing him out. For those who are interested in my original thoughts on the character, I'd recommend watching the video I made about him a little while ago. In that video I straightened out the biggest misconception people had about DVD's Ghostface. He's not a character from Scream and doesn't seem to exist in Scream's universe, but is instead an original character made by Behaviour. A rather more professional and successful serial killer than any of the Ghostfaces throughout the Scream franchise. While the Ghostfaces of Scream are typically amateurs, undone by their inexperience or underestimation of their victim, usually Sidney Prescott, this Ghostface is meticulous and precise, stalking and observing the habits of his chosen prey for weeks, and planning exactly how to infiltrate their homes and kill them, before writing about the murders in the newspaper, spreading the terror of the Ghostface killer to the people of Roseville, Florida. Look at the bright side people of Roseville. If the Ghostface kills you, at least you don't have to live in Florida anymore. In many ways, this Ghostface was a typical masked serial killer, devoid of the slasher satire that was Scream, with the only humour present in his characterization being his own enjoyment of his work and how he gleefully revels in the control he has over others. He's a textbook psychopath, fueled by ego and a desire to prove his superiority and that's reflected in the costume swap. From the baggy and amateurish Halloween costumes we see in Scream, to the more practical hooded cowl and shroud that styled more like a trench coat. There are a lot of Scream references in his design, such as the hunting knife that he wipes just like the ghost faces of Scream, but at his core he is his own character. Which is why a tome for him was both quite likely, as he's an original character of behaviour had a lot of creative control over, and also potentially hazardous. A tome is when a character's actual thoughts, feelings and motivations need to be consistent and compelling. That's something the story could easily have had a problem with. DBD has its fair share of heartless psychopaths, like the Doctor and the Clown, and for this story, Danny needed to set himself apart from them and prove he was interesting enough to talk about without the novelty of, ooh, it's the funny Scream mask, while also not just being a carbon copy of Scream's characters. I am incredibly pleased to tell you Danny's tome story, Beneath the Mask, is nothing short of a resounding success. It's a properly fantastic story that shows us the day-to-day -day life of a local serial killer, and gives us more of the character that was hinted at in the base lore, plus a ton of stuff that's totally new, and yet remains perfectly in character and held up to what we already knew about him. It also gives us a hint as to how Danny turned out the way he did, with an obsession with killing and precision coming from his father. Danny's dad was a soldier, in what was implied to be Vietnam, and seemed to bring back that lust for blood that characterised the American military's attitude to the Vietnam War back with him to his son, at least as far as Danny is concerned. He wanted his boy to grow up to be a soldier too, a life Danny perceived as one of killing and order in equal measure. And while we do know he was Danny's first murder, it's clear he still took much of his father's values to heart, or at least what he took of his father's values. I do like that the story gave us some background to work with by showing us how he turned into the ghost face, but doesn't justify it at all. It's a pretty tasteful way to give Danny a Freudian excuse that allowed him to rationalise his life choices, but it doesn't make him a misunderstood character, rather one that is misunderstanding the world around him and what his father tried to teach him. The first part of the story seems to be easing us into Danny's normal routine as a serial killer about town, as he isolates and observes his newest victim to be, the anthropology professor John Michaels. Everything about him is examined to surgical precision to make sure he's the perfect candidate for Danny's next murder. From his unimpeachable profession, so anyone who reads it is sure he didn't deserve it, to even his name. Two first names that will draw any Johns and Michaels to the headlines and strike the fear into them, consciously or subconsciously, that they might be next. What we're witnessing here isn't the murderous compulsions of someone like the clown, but the expansion of a carefully crafted reign of terror, 
The construction of a narrative that the Ghostface Killer of Roseville is at large, is too intelligent and powerful to be stopped, and could be coming for you. This intersects perfectly with Danny's day job as a reporter for the Roseville Gazette. He capitalises on his job at the paper to basically be his own propaganda officer, to keep people scared and select his victims appropriately. The first few memories in Danny's home story play this angle up effectively by showing us a normal day in the life of Roseville's famous serial killer. If this was how the rest of the story was set to go, following Danny's newest kill and the aftermath that he writes a story about it, it probably would have been a pretty okay home story. Nothing too special, mind you, but it would be a satisfying enough exploration of Danny's desire for control and capacity to exert that control over others. Kind of similar to the clown story, which was a fun little diversion to show us a day in the life of Kenneth Chase, even if it wasn't terribly useful or informative. But this is when the story's pace and tone takes an interesting turn. One that elevates Beneath the Mask from a slasher slice of life anime episode into an astonishingly elegant meta commentary on how horror fans perceive and judge the media they purport to love and their fellow horror consumers. This might sound very out of left field, but it makes a lot of sense once you read the story. In John Michael's house, Danny is putting his plan into action when he sees a magazine, the Urban Farce, covering his killing spree as the ghost face in less than complimentary terms. Turns out a little while ago, Danny had intentionally left behind a drunken witness to tell his story as a way to spread tales of the murders. But when the Urban Farce got their hands on the account, they rendered it in parody. A cartoonish reimagining of the witness's ghost face story, and Danny was not having it. He starts raving to himself, coping, seething, moulding. Like every Survivor main YouTuber realising they have to get a real job now because spying children on giving vault speed has removed their primary source of income. Like, it's hard to get across just how mad Danny is at this development, because the very notion of parody, of being made fun of, is absolutely unthinkable to him. It gets him so worked up that he backs out of his design and leaves Michael safe in his home, because he doesn't want to ruin the delicate planning he put into it with a messy emotional kill clouding his judgement. Besides, he has far more important things to be doing. The urban farce's cartoonish portrayal of him has slandered his carefully cultivated public reputation, and he's got some repair work to do to get it back into acceptable condition. So he spends the entire night collecting copies of the urban farce in the back of his car before he sets about the business of revenge monitoring the editor's P.O. box to track down those responsible for the cartoon's publication. Throughout this whole affair, Danny's ego becomes more and more prominent to the point of being laughable, as his reaction to a bit of light parody is absolutely overkill, which he resorts to to preserve his fragile sense of superiority. He needs the people of Roseville to fear him, because it isn't enough to establish his dominance through killing, he needs Roseville to be utterly at his mercy, and for everyone to know that, for him to be satisfied. And to properly understand why this is so interesting, we're going to need to talk about the pop culture phenomenon that pushed the Ghostface mask into the public consciousness. The genre-defining horror satire, Scream. While I do want to reiterate that Scream and DBD's versions of Ghostface are unrated in terms of canon, there's something to be said about the similarities and differences between the two pieces of media with how they interpret their ghost faces, especially the original Scream. While the mantle of Ghostface changes hands in every Scream film, the original Ghostface is actually two people, the high school students Billy Loomis and Stu Marker. Despite Billy blaming Sidney's mother's affair with his father for how he turned out and seeking revenge, it's clear that both Billy and Stu are primarily motivated by the idea of being celebrity serial killers as they hope to see the Ghostface killings become a legend among the people of Woodsboro. Billy and Stu were driven in large part by their massive egos, especially Billy who shouldn't be the more domineering and driven of the two killers. Billy claims to be motivated by revenge, but they already got revenge on Maureen Prescott by killing her and framing Cotton Weary for her murder, and if they wanted to go further they could also have killed Sydney and her father but that doesn't explain everyone else they killed along the way, or the theatrical fashion in which they did it. Despite what either of them said during the film, they were driven primarily by ego, a desire to make history and have their name in lights, like Jason Voorhees or Michael Myers. This motive was pretty heavily inspired by the real-life killing spree of Danny Rowling. 
the Gainesville Ripper who murdered eight people because he wanted to be a superstar serial killer like Ted Bundy. Except Scream is a deconstructive satire of slasher films and Billy and Stu's ego trip precedes a catastrophic reality check as a delusion of grandeur come unstuck and the victims turn the tables. They're not Jason or Michael. They're two high schoolers in over their heads who subsequently bite the dust due to their overconfidence. Danny Rolling, oh sorry, I mean Johnson, Danny Johnson. I wonder where they got that name from. Does share Billy and Stu's overwhelming egotism, but crucially is far more competent. As Danny's never shown in the story to be unskilled, or incapable of killing his prey without getting caught. It's not like he overestimates his capabilities. Instead, his ego surfaces when he's made fun of, and his carefully maintained public image starts to show cracks. It's one of the many parts of this story cultivated to make Danny a somewhat laughable character without making him incompetent and thereby making him less threatening. While we watch Danny sweating buckets in his overheating sedan, or collecting papers like a litter picker, we get to have a little chuckle at a character who is for all intents and purposes not a laughing matter, and it reminds us that despite his impressive body count and precise efficiency as a killer, he's just kind of a pathetic man-child who throws a tantrum over the pettiest shit possible. It's the perfect portrait of a psychopathic killer. Somewhat dangerous and pathetic at the same time. Once he tracks down the publishers of the cartoon, Danny gets into his normal business of stalking them, finding out whatever he can to get the measure of his victims by monitoring their movements and tracking their routines to the minute. He gets the measure of three young men, Tom, Pete and Bradley. Danny's so-called Three Stooges, who work at the Roseville Coliseum Arcade and print the paper in their downtime. He tries to get into his normal habits, staking the place out over a number of nights to appropriately plan his latest design. But while the boys are blowing off steam playing laser tag, Danny notices something that brings out that angry man-child all over again and elevates the story once more. Because here's where it starts to get meta. In the Coliseum staff room, Danny finds the Three Stooges having a spirited discussion about horror movies and slashers of legend, and by the sounds of it, they're not terribly reverent of them. I think Danny's perspective on the bickering he overhears sums up better than I ever could. Danny suddenly feels the blood rushing up his neck as they get everything wrong. Idiots poking fun at something they don't understand, or at best, think they understand. Idiots criticising some of the greatest designs and spewing vitriol about how they could have done better. So much better. Tom even suggests they should work together to create a design of their own. Give Roosevelt something to be really scared of. Danny clenches a fist and wants to rush inside the staff room and rip their heads off. He takes a moment to calm himself. In a week or so, we'll have his moment with these arrogant idiots. The intellectual masturbation of those who shout from the sidelines and wonder what it's like to actually step into the ring. Danny's cold, calculated plans for revenge to make these young men the subject of his newest design collapse in an instant at their sheer impudence. Besmirching his own name wasn't enough for them, they had to belittle everything he valued as well. Oh, this wouldn't do at all. Before I go on, I'm going to, need to talk about 2022's requel of Scream, known colloquially as Scream 5. This section is going to be pretty spoilerific, but there's a timestamp on screen now where you can skip ahead to avoid it because I'll be spoiling the major twist of the film, and it is a great movie, so I don't want to ruin anyone's experiences before they get a chance to see it. Scream 5 follows a very similar premise to the first one, to the point Sidney lampshades the plan of the new Ghostface as too derivative of the original. But where it differs substantially is the motive of the killers, in this case Richie and Amber. The two of them met on the subreddit for Stab, the in-universe film adaptation of Scream's events and became driven to go on their own murderer's rampage because they're angry at what their favourite movie series has become. The newest film in the franchise, Stab 8, was received really badly, and Richie and Amber were so incensed that they decided to go back to basics and make their own semi-reboot semi-sequel to the original by recreating the old story with new modern twists. Interestingly, while Scream 5 as a whole is a satire of these horror requels, like Halloween 2018 and Jigsaw, Richie and Amber's motive isn't really horror specific in the same way Billy and Stu's was. They're more like a riff on the toxic fandom that pervades not just horror, but so much of modern fan culture these days, as people project their expectations and nostalgia onto these favourite franchises and react with revulsion when these expectations are not satisfied. 
despite these criticisms coming from people who ostensibly love these franchises, they invariably do more harm than good, as harassment of creators and fellow fans alike becomes commonplace, and actual real criticism and discussion of these products in question become muddled by the horrific shit-slinging this vitriol inevitably creates. Richie and Amber represent the uh, higher fans culture. The backlash of nostalgic fans against the creators of their favourite media who have deviated from their perceptions of what that media should be like. But what does this have to do with Danny Johnson? While Richie and Amber are a commentary on toxic fans who think they're better than actual creatives, Danny's explosive reaction to the boys' ridicule is a commentary on toxic fans who think they're better than other fans, because they have different interpretations of the same pieces of media. When Danny overhears the boys' ridicule at the Legends of Horror, a well-adjusted person would probably just shrug it off even if they disagree. It's an opinion on a horror movie. It really isn't some cardinal sin worth getting mad about. Plus you're just going to kill them anyway, so it's not a big deal. But not Danny, ooh no. He instead abandons his design completely, giving in to the rage and rushing into the laser tag arena to take out his frustration with an act of impulsive bloody violence. By lashing out at the boys for the cry of not taking his favourite horror story seriously, Danny literally and figuratively lets the mask slip and shows who he really is in the dark. A pathetic, angry little man who cannot tolerate being made to feel insignificant. Whether Tom, Pete and Bradley are right or not in their belittling or mockery of the killers Danny holds in such esteem becomes totally irrelevant the moment he pulls out that knife, because it shows he takes this whole thing way too seriously. It's a petty disagreement, nothing to get mad about, but his monolithic ego means he lacks the perspective to see that. Danny's murder of the three boys is the culmination of every fan dispute ever, when one side goes a little bit too far because their inflated ego, desire to be proven right, and inability to consider any other perspectives gets in the way of actual understanding. Reflected in Danny is every overly obsessive fan who prides themselves on knowing every last piece of trivia about character and theme and motive, because their life revolves around it so completely that they have time for anything else. The kind of person who wastes no time to show off their understanding and wisdom, basking the recognition they receive for basically just showing off, but meet any disagreements with hostility instead of reconsidering their approach. The kind of person who gets way too worked up over petty squabbles, because their ego is so massive, their delusions of grandeur are so entrenched, that they'll tire themselves out, wasting their own time and energy trying to get the last word, instead of just moving on. The kind of hyper-fixated, perfectionist, anal-retentive, uptight no-lifer who spends way too long worrying about what everyone thinks of him and how smart everyone thinks he is. When for once in a while, for everyone's benefit, he could just step away from the discourse and touch some fucking grass. Wait, hang on. Why does that sound so familiar? As Danny stalks around the laser tag arena, processing what he's just done, we get to see him cooling down again as he follows Tom, the sole survivor of his frenzied rampage. And with the injured boy at his mercy, we get to see Danny at his lowest and most sadistic. With his blinding rage abated, all that's left is a sneering superiority as Tom's life is in his hands to play with like putty. In a way, it's Danny distilled into his purest form, devoid of the elaborate pretenses of the ghost face mask or the seething fury of his bruised ego. Just a cruel, cruel man, whose only joy is found in the suffering and powerlessness of others. He justifies himself as this misunderstood therapist, someone curing society of the sickness of safety and complacency. But it's all a fiction. You've just witnessed him losing it completely over his deflated ego, so any attempts at reinflating that self-importance completely fail. The kill lacks the voyeuristic thrill of John Michael's design, replacing any spectacle it could have had with a sickening sadism. And when he offers Tom that choice as to how he gets remembered, there's no mercy or even humour to it. It's pure spite. Danny rubbing Tom's impending death in his face, knowing he has complete control, and there's nothing Tom could ever have done to stop it. Danny Johnson ends his story as an unequivocally disgusting human being, and that disgust is the perfect way to round out Beneath the Mask. Because behind all the theatricality, behind the mask, is possibly Dead by Daylight's most pathetic character. 
He's a self-obsessed sadist with a fragile ego and a burning desire for respect, fear and recognition to distract himself from just how unremarkable he truly is. And it's his pathetic nature that makes this story work on every level. It makes the plot function, because if it wasn't for his ego, it'd just be a perfectly normal slice of life story at Roseville's best serial killer. It shows us his true character, as the mask slips and he gives in to his desire for domination. And it works on a meta level, as his love of horror and hatred of parody feed into his demand to be taken seriously, that ultimately misses the point of the very same movies and killers he puts on a pedestal. Of course it would be the Scream homage character who finds himself laden down with subversive meta humour, wouldn't it? Ghostface's new story genuinely feels like a subtweet thumbing behaviour's nose at overly serious horror enthusiasts like myself, and I fucking love it. And it does this while maintaining a more serious tone than Scream that fits DBD's grittier take on Ghostface like a glove. It manages to be an intelligent character exploration of one of DBD's most compelling killers that pays homage to Scream without just being a Scream ripoff. And that's just everything cool about DBD's Ghostface in my opinion. If you like the subversive meta humour of Scream, you should read this story. If you like Dead by Daylight's original storytelling and characters, you should read this story. And if you're like me and enjoy both, I think you'll be in agreement with me that this is the best licensed story we've ever had, and sets a fantastic precedent for future licensed tomes to come. There's been rumblings that the next chapter will bring more characters like Ghostface, hybrid licensed and original content that will be new behaviour characters written in the world of For Honor. And if that's true, I hope they're written with even half the intelligence, wit and self-awareness of Ghostface. And I hope this story in particular helps them do it. After all, how hard can it be to follow a very simple formula? It's a formula to it! A very simple formula! Well, it took me a while, but that's everything I have to say about Danny Johnson. I can't say I haven't been waiting a while for this story, but it was damn well worth the wait. Do you agree or disagree? Let me know what you think in the comments, I'd love to hear what you thought. And while you're down there, it'd mean a lot if you hit that funky subscribe button, rang the notification bell to make sure you don't miss the next upload, because I've got some really fun stuff planned. As well as the law friendly builds, I've got a couple of bigger videos planned out to come out in October, and I really can't wait to show you what I'm working on. In the description, you've got links to my socials, so you can find me on there to make sure you don't miss the next upload. And special thanks to Storky Boy for his excellent voiceover playing our ghost face. I could have done this video without him. So you can find him down there as well. Well, until next time, I'll see you then. Tata for now.